as you probably saw in the uh, email that went out for this, there's a teaching from the Buddha at the top of it all. And I'd like to read it again and then kind of unpack some of the key words in it and open it up for discussion. So this is uh, from the E.T. Vitaka, and um, the quotation is, by love, they will quench the fire of hate. By wisdom, the fire of delusion. Those supreme ones extinguish delusion with wisdom that breaks through to truth. So I'd like to unpack some of the words used here um, and uh, use that unpacking as a way to really ground in our experience of this. So with love or by love, they will quench the fire of hate. So Love is understood here very broadly, much more than romantic love. It includes good wishes, loving kindness, friendliness, um, compassion, certainly, standing up for others. Um, the Buddha lived in the real world, you know, he engaged the real world. And, and um, so he was, he was really talking about love in action. So with love, they will quench the fires of hate. Quench is an important word because it's a stand-in, it's a synonym for nirvana or nibbana in Pali, the language of early Buddhism, of putting out the fire, quenching. So right here is a teaching from the Buddha that through love broadly, we actually can move in the direction of our own awakening. And recent scholarship from the great a scholar of Buddhism, Richard Gombrich from Oxford, who wrote a really interesting book called What the Buddha Thought. I recommend it. It's a little technical in places, but overall it's, it's very readable and he pulls no punches. He's an opinionated British academic who has nothing to lose because <laughs> he's retired. Anyway, so it's a really interesting book, What the Buddha Thought. Okay, so <clears throat> Gombrich points out that if some of the Buddha's words are actually understood in their context of the time, he was saying that love can take you all the way. Love can really take you all the way into full enlightenment if it's fully pursued. It truly can quench. It can bring you to nirvana by quenching the fires of hate. Fire is a very commonly used metaphor in the teachings of the Buddha because it was prevalent in his time the Jain religions of his time and Hindu or Indian culture in general used fire a lot uh, in religious ways. And if, you know, this was 2,500 years ago, people had a lot of experience with fire. And so um, fire is a metaphor of things that are continually changing and also the fires of greed, hatred, and delusion. Um, you know, it's sometimes understood that uh, these are poisons, greed, hatred, and delusion. That's a later translation to call them poisons. The original understanding of the burdens of hatred and greed and delusion is that they are a kind of fire. So we are called to withdraw fuel from them. And with love, we withdraw fuel from hate, broadly defined. And it gradually, like fires do, when the fuel is withdrawn from them, they go out. If we hate hatred, we just feed hatred. If we bring contempt or ill will to those we oppose, as we've seen throughout history and we've seen at the same present time, we just perpetuate in some ways. We get sucked into the problem, even if our intentions are good at bottom. And I find it really remarkable to appreciate as a psychologist, a longtime therapist, a dad, a husband, someone very much in the world, someone who had a painful childhood, someone who you know, grapples with social issues today, to realize that um, it's more powerful. I mean, we need to regulate the wolf of hate inside our heart, as it were, metaphorically speaking, but it's most central to feed the wolf of love, to add fuel, to the fire, broadly, of love in all its ways, to cultivate love, to open to being lived by love. That's the most fundamental practice. 
I can say personally that um, there have been key turning points in my own practice over the years. And one of them definitely was around, I don't know, maybe 30 or so years ago, maybe 20 or so years ago, where I just really began to focus more on warm heartedness as a central practice for me. You know, I had the discernment part, you know, pretty well in place, you know, the understanding part, but the love, the warm heartedness, the juiciness, you know, the, the loyalty, the being for others, the large heartedness that can include a willingness to be uncomfortable and rattled and disturbed by what we feel when we really open our hearts to others. And frankly, sometimes what we feel when we recognize our own complicity or our own participation or unwittingness or taking advantageness in larger systems that oppress many other people, it's gonna make us uncomfortable. But there's something loving in that willingness to be uncomfortable uh, about it. So that's been a really important thing. So right there in the first line, we have, by love, we can move into a fundamental process of awakening for ourselves while also touching and serving and helping so many other people. And then the Buddha goes on to say, by wisdom, we can quench the fire of delusion. And right there, we have this recurring theme that is such a useful kind of refuge or foundation, the integration of love and wisdom. You have the juiciness, the, the physicality, the embodiment, the groundedness, the engagement of love. Um, there's a famous teaching, you may well be aware of it, in the so-called metta sutta, metta being a word for loving kindness or translated as loving kindness, in which the line is it that we should um, radiate loving kindness toward others and wish them well and even protect them as a mother would cherish with her life, her child, her only child, is the language there. And so we have the passion, the immediacy of love and the, and the willingness to put ourselves on the line with love, along with the clarity, the penetrating discernment, the diamond sword that cuts through, that recognizes the way this, things really are. You know, the two together, wisdom, and love together uh, are the two fundamental engines. They're the two fundamental um, fires. They're the two fundamental wellsprings of the overall process of awakening. Sometimes we tilt one way more than the other. Sometimes we need to. You know, I had the, <laughs> I don't know if I'd call it wisdom. I had the understanding piece, you know, and some, uh, to some extent, I needed to tilt toward love. I needed to tilt toward a kind of large-hearted generosity and being less in control, less tight and contracted as a, someone who knew things. And on the one hand, on the other hand, some people, um, they could be balanced better by engaging more of the wisdom factor, the clarity, the discernment, the, the rigor, the mental training, the discipline of it all, the understanding. Uh, that's really important too. And uh, you may have heard me tell the story of the time I was in a relatively small meeting with the Dalai Lama, maybe 25 or so years ago, in which um, he was giving a teaching that was full of understanding uh, with, of course, his kindness and warm heartedness. And then he realized that the people in the room, uh, many of whom, most of whom were serious senior teachers, we're not really aware of a, a key teaching from Tibetan Buddhism he was talking about. And he kind of famously, and this became the picture on the front page of the newspaper the next day, went like this, I can't do the Dalai Lama, and said basically, if you're like, if you don't understand, if you don't study, you are like a mouse. You may be happy, but you don't know anything, essentially. So it's important to bring in the wisdom factor. And you might want to think about, you know, what your own proper balance might be these days around love or wisdom or the intersection of the two. Uh, lately, I've been really exploring the felt sense of the integration of compassion and clarity. Now, you might wanna use other words for that. There's kind of a feeling that happens when we use certain words, you know, find your own words. For me, when I go clarity, compassion, the two together, 
there's something that really works for me about that. You know, the clarity, the openness, it's almost like you're sitting on top of a mountain, seeing far, it's cool there, the air's a little crisp sometimes, but it's refreshing, it's bracing, there's clarity. And it's, it's while we are fallible, the clarity has a sense of, yeah, the, this is how it is. You know, I'm not perfect in my recognition of reality, but in, in our sense of clarity, we have a feeling for the way it actually is. Combined with a warm heartedness, you know, compassion without clarity, it's good, but it can be kind of a mess. We can, you know, get overwhelmed, lose our footing. Clarity without compassion is just too cool, too logical, too detached, the two together have a particular power. So you might want to think about the application of this in particular relationships. How do clarity and compassion come together for you in important relationships? Okay, so we have wisdom and love together. The jewel and the lotus is the traditional metaphor. And which is which has actually gone back and forth historically in the iconography of Buddhism. And I kind of like thinking about love as the jewel, you know, we kind of would tend to think of it as, oh, that's the wisdom part. But actually, traditionally, uh, the jewel was understood to be love in the lotus of wisdom, a lotus that is grounded in the real, in the way it really is. There's a Zen saying, no mud, no lotus. <laughs> Our wisdom can grow out of the mud of our own real life. So either way, you know, you're just playing with it either way, but the wisdom, uh, um, the lotus and the jewel together. Okay, wisdom and love. And then the Buddha continues. He talks about the supreme ones, which is really a way of translating. I don't particularly care for the word supreme there. Different people translate it in different ways. It's basically those who really, really um, go all the way and who really, really fulfill the path of awakening. So those supreme ones extinguish delusion with wisdom that breaks through to truth. So there's a sense of aspiration here that we have a chance in our practice, yes, to be a little calmer, be a little nicer, get through the day a little, with a little less friction, a little less um, sorrow and woe. That's great. <laughs> you know, that's really good. And is that it? Is that the whole of your practice? Is that the whole point? Or along the way, through the love we bring into this breath, for the wisdom we also bring into this breath, again and again, can we gradually shed our own afflictions? Can we gradually withdraw fuel from our resentments, our tangles with others, our fussing and feuding, our contentiousness in our own mind, can we gradually disengage that so that more and more there's just a clear field. There's basically awareness and love. There's wisdom and love pretty much and then appropriate action, breath after breath, chopping wood, carrying water in the Zen saying, breath after breath, you know, famous Zen kind of saying, um, what is Zen, someone asked. And the response from the teacher was, after eating, clean your bowl. <laughs> Practice lived. But still, with a feeling for the ultimate aspiration. Why not? Why not? We may not get all the way. I don't know if I'm going to get all the way in this life. I'm aiming for it. Um, I probably ought to pick up the pace. <laughs> in my own case. And still, we can take the next step. Are we moved to take the next step? And I'll finish here in a moment and open it up for, for a conversation. Um, this fundamental principle of withdrawing fuel from what we hope to eventually quench and blow out, which is the root of the word for nirvana in the language of early Buddhism, and in India, in an in Sanskrit altogether. Um, if we're interested in that, while also wanting to add fuel to the fires of love and compassion and kindness, including, important point, compassion on our own behalf for ourselves, a feeling of supportiveness and tenderness 
you know, find your words. For me, words like tender or sweet applied to oneself really land, really land. I, I know what that feels like when I'm tender and sweet toward another person. I know what it feels like when someone is tender or sweet to me. Can we be tender and sweet to ourselves? You know, can we lean in to ourselves much as we would lean into others? That's included in the field of love. Um, and so when we engage this practice, as I finish here, withdrawing fuel from that which we just want to disengage from. We feel it for a time, but at some point we take the fuel of rumination away from it. We don't keep feeding it. We don't keep following it. We don't keep allying with the voices in our own head that are unwise and unloving. You know, we disengage. While at the same time, we add fuel to kindness, friendliness, support, compassion for ourselves and others. What I like about this process is that it's not, it does, it's not a big struggle. It doesn't have to be a big struggle. It's disengaging from what's painful, afflictive, unwholesome, full of suffering, full of harm, just disengaging, disengaging, disengaging. And meanwhile, leaning in and fueling that which is wholesome and positive. You might really think about this in concrete ways. What's one specific way you could add less fuel to some fire of broadly hate in your mind? Some, or more broadly, anything that leads to suffering for others as well as yourself, perhaps. One thing, one way, kind of from now on. Like for me, uh, living uh, in close quarters with my wife right now, uh, it's a personal practice for me to get really fast about disengaging from silly little quarrels, including inside my mind, which sometimes includes saying a little thing and then whew, drop the coals, drop those hot coals as fast as one can. That's a personal practice for me these days. You might also think about what's a personal practice for you these days about one way, concretely, on a daily basis, you want to add a little fuel to the fire of love. You know, bringing a little more supportiveness maybe to a, another person, a little more recognition of the loads they're carrying too. Um, maybe bringing a little more words of praise and acknowledgement to others. Uh, you know, maybe being a little more helpful, maybe standing up for them a little bit more with others at work or in society altogether. What's one way? What's one twig or stick you want to add going forward to your own fire of love? And as we do that, we can feel that, in, that we are carried along in a sense. We are lived by love. There's kind of a wellspring moving through us. There's an energy moving through us. We're carried along by heart, carried along by our good intentions. Rather than scratching and clawing to become something we're not yet, Instead, we open to and are lived by what we already are. And it reminds me of uh, training to climb Mount Whitney, which I did some years ago through a rock climbing route on the face, um, 14,500 and some odd feet. Uh, and and um, as I was training to do it, uh, I would run and jog in an indoor gym uh, four miles every time, four miles a day. And I would start to feel, I would imagine that there was a rope as it were, a cord of light attached to my heart area that was pulling me forward as I ran. And that feeling of being drawn toward the goal, you know, moved, pulled along toward the goal, uh, right, is a wonderful way to experience your own practice, to be lived by the best in yourself, what is wholesome, what is wise, what is loving, what is good. So may you be lived in that way. So now in terms of responding, I'm gonna take a look at uh, the chats that have come in and I'll see if there's a comment or question there. And then we'll do for sure, I'll open it up for some people if they like to uh, you know, wave their hand at me. Uh, I'll bounce through the screens pretty fast and uh, get your voice in the room. 
Um, it's helpful if you do have a question uh, to, um, or comment, to make it succinct and related specifically to what we're talking about here um, and a value you know, to people in general who are participating here. Okay, uh, there's some wonderful comments coming in. That's great, a lot of birthday greetings for, for Ziba. You, <laughs> your son really got the job done here. <laughs> see, but it's great. Uh, let's just see any, oh, thank you for all the nice comments you're making um, about neurodharma. Good stuff. Any questions maybe down toward the bottom? Um, let's see, someone asked me, do I, I have many books? I have six right now. Who knew? There's a seventh coming probably in a couple of years called Just One Thing for Love. So speaking of the timeliness of that, but anyway, which one do I recommend? Uh, if I were to recommend, honestly, a book for people who have a real interest in practice, Neurodharma is a really good summary of a lot of material that I've covered already. And a no holds barred, you know, very enthusiastic shot at the upper reaches of potential. You might really like Neurodharma. You know, I'm, and I'm very fond of the writing in it, honestly, as a, some I step back and I can see the kind of poetic and heartfelt quality of the writing there. All right, any questions or comments? What neural pathways are engaged with warm-heartedness? Um, there's a way of relating to this question that's kind of abstract. I'm gonna stay away from that. I'm gonna focus on what's practical. Uh, we are a enormously social animal. I mean, if you think about attachment and childhood and so much that's involved with that, we're kind of hardwired in many ways to be loving and, emotionally available for other people. So, so why then, someone reasonably asks, are we so horrible to each other so often, right? It's really a deep teaching. And uh, I think the fundamental takeaway from that is that we're designed to cooperate with us, but to fear and mistrust and be casual about aggressing upon those who are considered to be them. This is you know, the result of the evolution of the two wolves in our heart, or more broadly, what it's like to evolve as hunter-gatherers who mainly live in small bands, 40, 50 people, sometimes cooperating with others, but a lot of violence and terrible things between bands. So we have these capacities within us. For me, the takeaway is to appreciate that who we are mainly at heart is grounded in the fact that we lived mainly with others in our band. So the wolf of love, our cooperative inclinations and related capacities for empathy, attachment, bonding, um, altruism and love are really, really central to us when we're not threatened, when we don't feel threatened by the other tribe coming over the hill. And then we have a very powerful tendency to do whatever we need to do to deal with them. So as soon as we start making the distinction between us and them, the wolf of hate starts looking around. And as soon as we start believing or feeling that we are mistreated by them, or we are desperate in our own tribe, our own band, then the wolf of hate really starts looking for someone to bite. So these are strong tendencies in us, and there's a lot of underlying hormonal processes and neurochemistry. For example, anger of all the so-called negative emotions is the only one that, is, that feels rewarding and has reward processes um, of dopamine essentially associated with it. That's why we have to be very careful about anger. People don't like feeling ashamed or sad or anxious. In the first rush of anger, it feels really pretty darn good. The Buddha's metaphor for anger is, you know, it has a honeyed tip and a poison barb. So we have to be particularly careful about that. And that's why also I think it's very useful, and there's a lot of research on this, that we can cultivate the neural circuitry and the hormonal processes involving oxytocin and natural opioids and other factors that enable us to rest stably in a lovingness, even as we deal with others that we're in conflict with, or even as we pursue justice, we can stay rested in the feeling of love and strengthen it. Uh, one beautiful way to do that is to tune into the area of the heart as you breathe. Another support for that 
is to feel that you can be grounded in your own intactness and all rightness, even as you're dealing in conflict, because it's when we feel very threatened that it's very difficult to sustain that feeling of love. So to kind of help oneself feel okay and grounded authentically, always authentically, then that enables us to not have um, fear and anger hijack our natural lovingness. You see, it's kind of like feeling like a deeply rooted tree. You can become more open to the winds blowing through you. Okay, so I want to see if there's any people who maybe have a question or comment. I'm going to bounce through and see if you have a hand raised, any hands raised, anybody want to say anything? Yeah, great. I see Dorothy. Dorothy, I'm unmuting you. Dorothy W. Hi, thank you, Rick. So I have a practical um, question just to follow on what you were saying. Yeah. I feel like for me, I've been making strides in staying grounded and balanced and warm hearted. And I definitely, that's like a go to tool that I tell myself when I'm not in the moment. Mm -hmm. And then what I'm finding is that there are particular people. And sometimes they even admit it, like they're goading me oh, yeah. to like, because I think it's scary to them perhaps to see me change. And so it's like, I've seen that recognition sometimes when they're like, oh good, you're still fiery, you know? And then also if I stay really grounded, it, and this hurts even more, I think, is I get this reflection that like, oh you must think you're better than I am because you've been practicing all this. And I just fall for it. <laughs> so how in like that very practical kind of moment, and perhaps it's totally imagined in my head, but it, it feels real that I'm getting, um, I don't know, there's an actual goading or yeah, name calling. Wow, there's so much. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Really, there's so much in that, right? Um, and I think, you know, I'm seeing other people just, you know, clap or nod or agree. Yeah. So a couple things here. I don't know, you know, all the particulars and all. I'll just offer a few things. Um, one, as a longtime therapist, there's this idea of systems that have a certain equilibrium family systems or social systems, you could say, or even in a couple, and they tend to want to maintain their equilibrium. So I think of it a little bit like a mobile with, in which are different parts just sitting there in kind of still air. Maybe there's a, a little bit of movement, but it's fundamentally in equilibrium. Then when one person changes, like you, other uh, just forces in the system tend to resist that change and want to restore the, the old way of being, right? So recognizing that, I think, is a, gen, is a useful thing. It's kind of common humanity in a way, or it becomes more impersonal. You can kind of see it like that. You can also see the motives in other people deep down. And I think that's really useful. To, that's where the clarity comes in, in part. We know we don't, we can't read people's minds, but still we can start to recognize what their true intentions are, or more exactly, what the sort of summation of their intentions are. Even if their intentions, they have multiple intentions that pull them in different direction. If you want to observe what people really want, observe what they do, bottom line. Clearly what you want is to practice and make room for your fieriness. That's cool, and uh, I want to, Super be crystal clear. I think if anyone belongs to a group of people who have been historically muzzled or shamed for their intensity, their anger, their, their grievances, their complaints, their outrage, and there's, there are numerous categories there, and one of them certainly is women over the ages. Uh, I think it's especially important, you know, especially for people like me, kind of an older white guy in a position of authority, to be crystal clear that in no way, shape, or form am I trying to you know, aid or abet that silencing. And, and sometimes we're kind of messy in the beginning. You know, not always. Uh, I'm kind of messy sometimes when I'm pissed off about something, but I try to gradually find my footing and all that. So there's a place for that initial burst, not having to be perfectly scripted and managed and so forth. And we try not to be too horrible. 
<laughs> in the first burst, but still there's room for that. Okay, so we start to see the intentions of others. And uh, we start to recognize over time where they're really coming from. And that's part of clarity. And then we make, you know, we decide what to do. Sometimes we try to reach out to them and ask them to stop doing certain things or to be more supportive or to use different words because the words they're using are landing hard, understandably. They're, they're hurtful, they're wounding, their tone is really important. Um, and I think it's perfectly appropriate to ask people to make agreements, whether it's about doing the, you know, their share of the housework or watching how they talk to us. Right? Uh, my long suffering wife, you know, often many, the examples, you know, we had a little back and forth about a vitamin bottle this morning in which, man, there was something edgy in her tone. And I didn't think it needed to be there. And after she got done, I sort of said, what's up with that? You know, and we kind of had to talk, we talked about it a little bit. And, it, and I could see that then I learned the larger context and I understood where that edginess was coming from, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, there's a place for making requests around tone. And even making requests about what people do inside their own minds. Hey, all right, would you be willing to make some effort inside your own mind to sustain attention to me for at least a couple minutes in a row? Right. I don't think that's a big ask. So I, I think these things. And then after we do that, if we do it at all, we see what they do. And we sometimes judge that it's not appropriate to bring stuff up and we just back away. We just back away. And there are ways to help yourself do that, like imagining that you're looking at them through a wall of glass. They're there, you see them, but they're on the other side of it all. Um, you know, maybe you have a sense, or you just kind of look at them and just think to yourself, wow, I wonder what it's like to be you, right? You have to be careful you don't slide into contempt, you know. You well, I, I was going to jump in there. Yeah, please. I, I I'll finish, yeah. You know, we'll... I can hear the judgment start coming up of like, well, give them space and they're less educated. They're this, they're that, mm. you know, and it's, then I just feel like I'm slipping into judgment and I'm getting further away from love. And so I don't know how to stay in understanding and not go to judgment. You know what I mean? That, that's a great question. How, can, super how, close. how do you do that? <laughs> yeah. So discernment doesn't mean we can judge. There is a place for values, yeah. right? But when it becomes um, hostile or contemptuous, that's where it's difficult. Mm. Do you have a feeling for the difference between discernment and hostility or discernment and contempt? I do. It's interesting, though, because um, when I start to get enraged, I, I lose the ability yeah. to distinguish. Yeah. Yeah. Long term, uh, maybe I'll just finish helpful. on. Thank you. Oh, yeah, totally. And I, I bet you know this already. I'll just say it for, kind of for everybody that at the end of the day, I really just observe like what it feels like to be with somebody. Do I feel bigger or smaller around them? Do I feel lifted up or weighted, or pushed down? Like I can just say for me, I don't really know you from before particularly, but I feel supported by you. I feel a little bigger, a little more open, you know, like there's a camaraderie here. And that's my bottom line, right? On the other hand, there's certain people you walk away and maybe they're all smiles, but somehow you just feel smaller when you walk away or like you got to prove yourself more. Ah, mm. That's kind of a clue. Yeah. Good stuff. And Thank at the you. end of the day, they're going to do what they do. They have their own fate. You know, one of the deep teachings of the Buddha, it's this paradox that we're completely interdependent and at a, ultimate level, there's just one, right? There's only one reality. On the other hand, we each have our own karmas. We each have our own fates. We can only practice for ourselves at the end of the day. I mean, we, we, only we can do our own practice. That's a better way to put it. And you start to realize that they're going to do their thing. And meanwhile, with love, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on myself. Yeah, I think that that's the, the particular person I'm thinking of right now. I think that what makes me sad is that yeah. um, I feel like the root of the problem is actually they feel so small and so unlovable mm -hmm. that there's these things that are thrown out because of that. And so I tend to be drawn in wanting to say, you are lovable, you are worthy, you are all these things. Yeah. And then it, you know, and I, you're right. It's not work that I can do for that person. And I think just maybe loving from where I am and not getting drawn in and then 
kind of slam back with yeah. help. Yeah, I'll I'll just observe. You know, as I think about my experience of my teachers and their their teachers, when I watch them interacting with other people, what you see is a fearlessness. Like they're they're open. They're not they're not scared, right? Their heart might be beating a little because the person is yelling at them from the other side of the room, maybe. But you know, they're they're there. They're like a tree, right? Um, and then they say what they have to say, and then to my amazement. They don't keep pounding on their point. <laughs> they just say it. They just drop that communication in. It's from the heart. It's their truth. It's whatever it is. And the other person's going to do what they do. And then that's it. So I've tried to learn from them. Okay. Thank you very much. I think thank we have you. time for one more person. I want to see if there's another person. Okay. Sophia, I see your hand there. Sorry. Maybe Pamela, I'll be able to get to you next time. Sorry about that. Uh, and I'll try not to have such long responses myself. Uh-oh. So, Sophia. Great. I've unmuted you. There you are. Okay, Good. great. Hi, Rick. Um, first of all, just real quick, I would like to thank you for the answer to the first question about the neural pathways. It was a very good review of the neuro neurodharma week two. Um, and, and I was like, this is great. I remember all of this stuff. So thank you for that. You're a good student. Um, great. But um. My, my issue that I'm having um, is it has to do with the po political climate that we're in right now. And um, I am, for the most part, a very warm hearted, very loving, almost like when you, when you said like sometimes it's a little too much, you need to work on the wisdom part a little bit more. Sometimes my heart kind of goes over my brain. And, but um, I am having such a difficult time with my hostilities towards our leader. And I just am like, I don't recognize myself um, in the feelings of hostility and um, just, I, 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 I like, I can't even, I can't even put into words the feelings mm -hmm. that, that he stirs up in me. Yeah. And I actually read a comment that, that you, you had answered a question to somebody else on your, on your website about, you know, trying to think of him as, as what it must have been like as a child and, and, you know, the difficulties he may have faced about not measuring up and all of that. And I try so hard and in my meta every night, he's my difficult person and I try so hard. I, I don't know what to do because I feel like that, that loving part of me just is so missing there. And um, I, I feel like it's making me deficient in some way. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sophia. I can see from the comments coming in on the chat that you're, you're saying something for many, many people. And so I'll try to be succinct here. Okay. Just in the interest of time, the very deep question. Yeah. So First, to generalize it, on any side of the political aisle, or not about politics, about family, about neighbors, we can have extremely strong reactions to certain people, and we can feel very appropriately that um, they're doing bad things, we're appalled by them, we're outraged by them, and we can't believe it, we're stunned, you know, all the rest of it. And sometimes we can see very conspicuous psychopathology, you know, enormous narcissism, sociopathy, lack of impulse control, uh, complete willingness to trample on others in various people. And whether that's a person's opinion about Donald Trump or your opinion about someone else, you know, that's, that's, that's real. That's very, very real. And then the larger question becomes, you know, how do we practice with that, right? Um, I can't say everything. I'll just try to offer a few reflections here that I think are consistent with what the Buddha has taught, who, um, was in his own time and his, his followers after he passed away were willing to speak truth to power and to call out terrible, terrible things. You imagine just the bloody wars, terrible atrocities in just India, like around the world 2,500 years ago, you know, um, and 
of course, there's been no end to that today. So the short version is um, we can use this moral response of outrage, moral disgust, being appalled. We can use it to guide our discernment and our wisdom, right, and our clarity. We can also use it to fuel our response and our allyship with others who are being very, very concretely impacted by those we oppose. We can do that. Also, we can not let them invade our own heart and remain. And here's where um, I'm reminded by someone who grew up in Haiti under uh, baby Doc Duvalier. Uh, he became a writer. He fled the country in his very early 20s ahead of the death squads. And so he lived under a truly brutal dictatorship just the worst of the worst imaginable. And he eventually found his way to Canada, became a dishwasher in restaurants, getting a job, started to write more and more, recently got a big award from the, Brit from the French Literary Society. He writes in French. And he made a comment that I've thought about many, many times ever since, as someone who grew up. He said, when you're living under a dictator, they just want you to think about them all the time. They don't care if you like them. They don't care if you oppose them. They just want to be the topic of conversation all the time. And wow, did that make me think newly about politics. And so uh, the Buddha talked about not allowing pain and poison to invade his heart and remain. That's the thing. That outrage can arise. We can feel it. But does it, are we obsessed with it? Does it preoccupy us endlessly? Uh, can we not let it invade our heart and remain? That's a really important distinction, right? That's, that's really central here. Um, to me, it's bad enough, whoever they are, whether it's a schoolyard bully when you're in junior high or first grade or your step-parent when you're a kid or some horrible coach you know, for your baseball, Little League baseball team for one season, or uh, the prime minister or dictator or president of your country, you know, bad enough that they've occupied a seat of power. Even worse to let them occupy your own mind. That's where we draw the line. And as we draw that line, we become more, frankly, able to be discerning and wise in how we deal with them. Yeah, just to finish, you know, we can, we, there's a term in psychology called stimulus bound. It, it describes ways that people, when they look at a Rorschach test, can get sucked into a stimulus. But more broadly, how we can just be bound to a certain stimulus. You know, and the Buddhist metaphor is like a post in the ground that a dog is chained to. Dog has a little freedom of movement, but is bound to that stimulus. And I think it's very important to be to reclaim an inner freedom so that we do what we do for its own sake, in its own right, lived by love moving through us, rather than in reactivity and, and being bound to the other. And I think that's true in our personal relationships as well, right? Um, if I got bound to my wife's tone this morning, you know, about the vitamin bottle, uh, then, you know, I'm, I'm stuck, I'm unfree, I'm unliberated, right? And liberation comes in many, many ways, most of them very small and incremental. And, um, you know, we find our own liberation in part uh, by being, helping ourselves become unbound to the enemy images, a term from diversity work inside our own mind, you know, from preoccupations with the other, bad enough that they've occupied, <laughs> you know, the halls of power, don't let them occupy your heart. You know, retain that freedom. Okay. Thanks, Sophia, a lot. <laughs>